Good afternoon and welcome to the Center Stage Seminar Series. My name is Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. I will be your moderator. Joining me today to showcase his center is Dr. Larry Hornbeck. Larry J. Hornbeck graduated from Case Western Reserve University in 1974 with a PhD in physics. He joined the faculty of the University of Texas at Dallas in 2017, following a distinguished 43-year career at Texas Instruments that began in late 1973 in TI Central Research Laboratories. In the early 1980s, Dr. Hornbeck pioneered the development of a high-speed binary spatial light modulator technology known as the digital micromere device. An array of millions of digital micromeres integrated along with CMOS control circuitry on a silicone chip. Dr. Hornbeck demonstrated the first DMD in late 1987. In 1992, TI began massive investments to commercialize the complex multidisciplinary technology in the semiconductor world. Known commercially as the DLP chip, the DMD is the basis for innovative products across a wide range of applications from digital cinema and laser television to 3D printing, LIDAR, hyperspectral imaging and more. Dr. Hornbeck is the single named inventor of the foundational patents for DMD technology, including the seminal patent US 5,061,049 spatial light modulator and method. Upon joining the faculty, he started the Center for Digital MEMS the first university research center of its kind. CDM's purpose is to develop a fundamental understanding of the complex interacting mechanisms that limit the DMD's performance, reliability, and scalability. Hornbeck's pioneering work has earned him wide ranging recognition from election to the National Academy of Engineering to winning an Academy Award of Merit Oscar statu statuette. He is a fellow of the Society of Motion Picture and Technology Engineers, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the International Society for Optical Engineering. Dr. Hornbeck, welcome. Thank you, Tiffany. Appreciate it. I, I'm glad to be here today, and I, I have something interesting for those that are watching, and I hope there's some watching live. and. Um, I stayed up pretty late last night going through the archives and added a bunch of things from many years ago. And you're going to get a firsthand look today at what DMDs are really like when you're trying to develop them. They're a very, a very unruly lot, those digital micromirrors. OK, uh, I divided this talk up into two parts. I put some times down, 15 minutes, 35 minutes. Uh, I'd be amazed if I got through the first part in 15, but I'm going to really try because the second part is something I think will be special for those that are watching. OK, so part A is just an introduction. Uh, what's this all about? And it's going to be really, really quick. I'm going to go back in time, but we're going to do it in three slides. I got a little video of how the DMP works. Uh, we're going to look at the whole thing put together. And as I said, uh, I guess many times to many people, if you take the whole package of DMD, the CMOS uh, circuitry that drives it, all of the algorithms, which are image processing algorithms, uh, we're in 200,000 theaters in the world. All of the world's theaters now have our technology. They're very sophisticated algorithms and optics. Uh, there's, it's really quite a package. I'm going to show you how they're manufactured and, and, and how do we operate them. And I'm not going to talk too much about applications. I thought I would, but I think there's some other interesting things that we can do. Uh, with our time today. OK, I'm clicking. There we go. OK, in part now, now I got to go back. Uh, if you get used to the lag. OK, oh my. OK, we're going to take some. What I call deep dives. Uh, it was not an option for TI in the early days, and we're going to 
find out why. And in fact, it's still not much of an option. And there are historical reasons for that. And hence the need for the Center for Digital MIMS. I want to show you what digital micro mirrors are really like when you try to develop them. All of the terrible things that can go wrong and how little we really, really know about the fundamentals. And then uh, I want to, want to show you what I have discovered this year. And it's surprising to me uh, in finding out what, what one of the main problems with the technology is. And, and, and uh, so I'll, I'll share that with you and then a, a brief uh, question and answer session. Little timeline up at the top, and I've got it marked off in uh, various intervals of time. I joined Texas Instruments in 73, uh, and, and from there to 77, I call that prehistoric times, and I actually developed CCD technology for imaging at the time. Analog dark ages, I worked on analog uh, micro mirrors, and when I invented the DMD, I called that the age of digital enlightenment, and when we started production, or I rather uh, development, the venture period, and then we went into production and uh, sold our first products in 96. So in 1977 uh, through about 1987, I developed analog light modulators, finally went to, uh, to integrated micromirrors, but they were analog and having failed to get the kind of performance that you would need I, I said, OK, fine, we're going to have to go digital. That meant sticking uh, mirrors and all kinds of problems, but we knew that we would have the kind of performance in terms of uniformity and speed. And in fact, a very unique technology in terms of speed, which allows you to do a lot of other things other than just projection displays. So from 87 until 92, uh, I actually developed a linear uh, digital micromirror device for printing. That was the first application. In 92, actually the summer of 91, TI got very irrational. And they started talking about wild things like high definition television and doing all sorts of things. And, and indeed in 92, they started pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into this technology. Well over $500 million were lost before we became very profitable. In fact, we we're very profitable to this uh, day. Here's the first DMD. I always show this. It's a very special time. This was a video that I took of the very first device. I believe that this device is in the IEEE uh, Chip Hall of Fame. There's the photo mass layout there on the left, and uh, you can see a schematic from the patent, the actual device. I put this device in a dark field microscope and didn't even have a projector for it. So you're looking right now at the bond pads of an integrated circuit. We're going to scan down, and there you'll see uh, the first digital micro mirrors. I had some of them turned off just to prove that I could address them. Now we go dark field with a microscope. For those of you that have used microscopes, so you only see light when they flash. And this is the way you'd use it in a display. And then because I had people that didn't think they were really switching in both directions, I put uh, red and blue cellophane in the annulus uh, inputs for the microscope. And indeed, they were flipped in both directions. Okay, um, we're in the next period of time. Uh, this is starting in 77. Uh, uh, we're getting into high definition television as they wanted, as TI wanted to do. And in fact, we had our own NASCAR before the whole thing was over. We spent $30 million for a NASCAR team in advertising. My true love was, uh, well, there's two true loves there. The birth of digital cinema and cinema in general, and then my wife, Laura. We're standing outside of a theater for the uh, episode of Star Wars Episode One. I'm sorry, and uh, this would be the world premiere of digital cinema in Burbank, California, June the 18th, 1999. And, and we've rapidly gone forward to today, and I'll speak a little bit about our products, but not a whole lot.
OK, so we're going to zoom down. To the surface of the DMD. And there you have ones and zeros. Those ones and zeros are coming from uh, memory circuits under the chip that either turn them on or off, and they simply switch light into or out of the lens of a uh, projection display. Now, if you want color, and this, uh, this single chip is the way that we went for many products. Uh, you use a color wheel and very sophisticated color algorithms, and it's a multi-segment color wheel. And, and we were very successful with that uh, technology, but also at the very other extreme, for the very largest theaters and for any kind of uh, laser uh, projection, for example, uh, we use three chips, one for red, one for green, one for blue. The thing about this technology is that everything was different from liquid crystal. Uh, the optics don't work the same. We had to virtually do everything from packaging to the optics design to algorithms, uh, everything TI had to invest in. That's why it was so expensive, why it took so long. So the DMD is really just a really dumb light modulator, just turns on and off like a light switch. So we have a, um, a data processor with embedded algorithms that actually drives the DMD and causes it to switch. And the algorithms that we use, I'll show you just briefly, well, right here actually. Uh, we take binary grayscale, and I'm going to click again. Yeah, there we go. And we take the bits, but we break them up. We split them up into little pieces. Uh, to fool your eye, and we do that in real time, of course. And I'll just go ahead and click through this. Now another video, how, how they're fabricated. I spent years developing this process, um, studied plasma chemistry, and tell everybody I went off to Princeton. <laughs> Actually, it was Princeton Applied Research in Princeton. I didn't go to the university, and I, I took a course in I think I was out there twice for plasma chemistry. Uh, but uh, I developed the process uh, long before the digital because uh, I had to use it for the for the analog technology. And it was the fact that we had a good eight to nine years lead on anybody in the world that wanted to compete with us. So we had uh, patents that were really retardants to anybody wanting to get into uh, the business. That's very unusual. Almost every technology you can think of in the world has multiple companies and sometimes even universities competing at the very beginning because no one has the complete picture. Uh, we came in with a good portion of the uh, complete picture and in so many different areas that you really couldn't see a way of commercially getting into this business. And so for that reason, uh, today, uh, TI has 100% of this, of this business. Of course, we have a whole bunch of OEMs. They're very creative people, and they've taken over a lot of the algorithm development and projector development, and then all of the new applications that have come out. So we start off with the basic uh, device. Uh, underneath that uh, micromirror is complementary metal oxide silicon uh, transistors. Uh, those are metallization layers. The metal three layer is the bottom layer for the DMD. And well, I don't know how many clicks I have here, so I'll just keep clicking. OK, there you see a torsion hinge, very flexible. Those spring tips where the mirror, the mirror is cut away, but those spring tips are where the mirror is going to touch down. And that limits its rotation to uh, 12 degrees. And there's a pair on the opposite side. And so all it does is just flip back and forth very, very quickly, depending upon which addresses electrodes are selected, it will flip one way or the other.
Okay. There's one mirror. And I'm showing the memory uh, circuit. And I don't know whether this is going to work too well or not. Uh, let's see if I can toggle it. So, so we have an SRAM cell underneath. Uh, it's cross-coupled inverters there with bit lines coming down, a word line going across horizontally. And in that configuration, we can very rapidly turn one or the other of those electrodes on or off. And depending on which one is on or off, they simply flip. Now, it's a little more complicated than that because <clears throat> we don't statically address. We actually launch these mirrors with a pulse. And if they're well-behaved mirrors, they make it to the other side. If they're not, why, we have a problem. So we have this uh, waveform. And can you see my cursor? And so uh, when we're ready to launch these mirrors, we hit the mirror underneath with a pulse on a bias bus. And depending upon whether the address electrodes are set for a one or zero, it will either stay or it will launch. Now, so, <clears throat> Let me go to the next uh, one here. There we go. OK, so uh, I'm going to show you some possibilities here. We're going to first of all, we're going to try to keep the mirror where it belongs. And so you can see that it stayed on the correct side. Now we're going to launch it. Oh, it fell, fell back. OK, so it was recaptured. Well, that particular mirror was right on the edge of what we call solution space, an optimum region. So we have to design our product so that many of 8 million micromirrors on a chip all function properly. You can't have any that aren't functioning. It would be very noticeable. Uh, there's one that crossed over. You can see it went from minus 12 to plus 12. And, and there we're going to have another fail. This one sort of made it across, but got there very, very late. I had meant to talk more about applications. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, in fact, I just grabbed this off the website and, and uh, we're in a bunch of areas. But if you go out and you and you look, you're going to find that we're in a lot of additional areas where DMDs are used to control uh, phase fronts and to do various things in directing light beams, like for LIDAR, uh, for many, many medical applications. You know, a lot of publications coming out every year. It's a very exciting field. I was amazed at, at how much we're doing out there that has nothing to do with imaging. OK, so the DMD was invented and, and developed and commercialized by a single company. All right, that is that is unique. I think the closest any company ever came to that was um, the original Xerox uh, process, but after about 15 years, they, they lost control of that. And I, can, I don't historically what the reason was, but it never happens because no company ever has that kind of lead where they have, because you have to continually generate new intellectual property. And of course, the investment just to get in is enormous. So that's discouraged people. Now, that's great. That's great. And you may have a downside, and I think we're going to talk about that, but it's a remarkable success story. TI is a remarkable company, trust me. I'm going to get into the second part now, and I want to do a little bit of explaining because I don't want you to think I'm critical of TI, but deep dives into the fundamental underlying principles of this technology were not an option. And Look at some of the reasons why that's true. And then, OK, so what's the purpose of the Center for Digital MIMS? And, and that should be obvious. I should be doing deep dives, OK? I'm going to show you some of these very unruly digital micromirrors and what they can do and how frustrating they can be and how, and how some things that happen uh, can't be explained if you don't know the fundamental underlying principles, there are just too many possibilities for what could have gone wrong. 
And so I have spent uh, some uh, time trying to understand and to put together a analytical understanding as opposed to doing finite element modeling or reduced order modeling or something, because if you don't have the fundamentals, you'll leave them out of the model and you won't get any results that are uh, that matter. But to understand these interrelationships has been very difficult for me. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Okay, why are deep dives not an option? Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's a downside, of course, to this success story. When you're investing hundreds of millions of dollars and your rest of the world is thinking liquid crystal technology, and they all have one another in universities and past experience to help them, you're developing something that nothing has been done on before. We've spent as much money on developing algorithms as we have on silicon. You have to do everything. And so we went alone. And so you do what you have to do to get your yields up, to try to get new ideas working. But you really, really, through all this activity, you can only make guesses as to what you need to do. And that can actually lead you down a path that you don't want to go, but you don't have any choice but stay there when you get there and make the best of what you've got. Nothing out there is applicable. Nothing out there is applicable. OK, <laughs> it's so amazing. Not even the plasma chemistry that's been used in the past by others is applicable to this, to this particular need. And so it was a luxury. And in, in 1996, it was still a luxury uh, and, and it's a luxury, uh, you know, it fell in the year. It just fell in the year, fell in 2021. So that's where the Center for Digital MEMS comes in. And I said to myself, uh, wow, this is going to be great. It's time for fundamental understanding. OK. Um, I retired in December of 2016. And I really hadn't planned on retiring, but I, but Dr. Hobson Willenthal made me an offer I couldn't refuse. A gentleman, wonderful gentleman. I deeply admire Dr. Hobson. Hobson um, helped me to get funding and offered the opportunity for me to establish the first research center devoted to digital mountains. And this is the mission statement. Guess what? It's right up front. Develop, develop a fundamental understanding of the mechanisms that limit performance, reliability, and device scaling. Digital MEMS devices. Now, let me explain. Probably haven't done that. MEMS is microelectromechanical systems. Uh, it's a generic term uh, for any uh, micromechanical thing. Uh, might not even be integrated on silicon. And I thought, well, I'll I'll give it the more generic name right now. I wish I hadn't, but I'll give it the more generic name. But there is only one digital MEMS device, and that's the DMV. OK, I promised you this. I uh, hope it isn't too too much for you, but OK. It, I just thought I'd show you uh, somebody a while back, a long time ago, actually, this is probably mid 2000 something. We had some kind of problem and I don't even remember what it was, but we built these uh, just the bottom part of the structure. Which you can operate not as efficiently because we were having uh, problems with the flexures buckling and you can see that that's actually two that I just superimposed, but you can see that one is popped up and one is popped down. That flexural energy that gets stored that, that allows you to do that is a thing that has plagued us from the very, very beginning. Try to tame that. I want to show you some other things that it can do. Uh, for example, we measure uh, how much the mirror stick 
by simply biasing them down with a DC voltage and then slowly lowering the voltage down. And if a device is pretty good, most of the mirrors release. But if a device isn't, there's a delay. You see this one has a little kink here. And then you don't get all of them, so you have to do some pulses to get them freed, okay? These devices are identical, except that we misaligned intentionally one of them in a particular direction. And you can see that that caused the device to buckle. It, it took more energy to get it to launch. And you can see right here that some of the mirrors actually unbuckled as they were transitioning over. So that's one way that you can, can, can have a problem with buckling with twist bend flexural energy. Here's another one, and, and this should blow your mind. The, these mirrors on both sides are pretty flat. There's an interferogram of the mirrors. These are a little bit more cupped. These are more typical of what we normally do. And, and here we're, we're lowering the voltage again. And you see here, I, I've gotten, I don't know if you can't even read that, but it's more than 10,000. For the mirrors that are flatter, we're getting much, much better performance in terms of release. I actually can tell you the whole sequence of events that causes that. But if you look from the top down, you just say, my goodness, there's practically no difference in that mirror shape. Is it the fact that there's not enough cylinder in it? Because this other one has a little more, you know, cylinder. Or is it something else? And is it maybe the, uh, the, the metal that holds the mirror down at the center? Maybe it's stressed. And so you start thinking about all the different things that can happen. And you never really do anything more than, well, you just try. And eventually it just goes away and you say, OK, well, flexural energy. Here's here's the top of the DMD. Uh, the mirror is connected here. The mirror uh, support post right there. And and so we ripped these mirrors off to see what the heck was going on. You can see how it broke here. And that's actually, actually very characteristic devices that, cut, that are what they do is when they launch. They buckle upwards and over. And they. You know, they mash the spring tips down and they take little mouse bites out. So each time it launches, it takes a little bit more metal out. Some of them will keep working indefinitely that way. Now here's another device. And you can see the problem there. And this is a little region that surrounds all of our connections. And, and it is very, very important. And it is one of the reasons for failure but it's a secondary problem. So these things are stacked up, uh, but the fundamental problem I'll show you in a moment. Let's take a look at another device. And by the way, uh, whoever's watching right now, you're the first ones, I think, to ever see this in public. We never show these things. I hope I don't get into trouble. This is very old data. Uh, we're way beyond this point, so I hope it's OK. OK, advance, please. There we go. Okay, you can see some marks here. This is where the backside of the mirror collided. Now, we build two types of devices, and I didn't show you a picture of the other one, but we build cantilevers that are connected only on one end. They're not torsional. When you release the twist bend flexural energy there, uh, you get a z-axis twist about the support post. Now, <clears throat> These, uh, instead of flipping 180, they flip through 90. So these are landed on, on that edge. Yeah, I'm not even going to bother to go back on the other edge. But the point is that when you don't have two torsion flexures pulling the device down flat, that it actually twists about the z-axis, and that is an in, in indication of uh, twist bend energy built into the structure. This is called this is called uh, uh, this is a Doppler uh, measurement that you do where you can measure uh, velocities. Uh, and actually, this is a transition. I'm applying a reset pulse. I'm, I'm pulling down against the spring tip. I'm launching that thing like a missile. But if I go to a low enough voltage, they'll start to fail 
and they won't cross over anymore. This one is, is failing much earlier than it should. Now, this is a real nightmare uh, because this, this tells you here that our model is at this time is qualitatively wrong. If I look at these uh, mirrors and I launch them, this is the minus 12 side and I launch them to the other side. And there, I, there I'm coming into the other side. I don't do what I should be doing, which is I should be doing a symmetrical settling out to 12 degrees. Here, I, I overshoot, but I come up against this, what looks like a hard stop, but it's not. It's it's not, it's that flexural energy building up and it just keeps you limited. You see how it's limited, okay? And that energy is now being stored and it's ready to do its damage uh, in one, one pixel is all it takes in devices. And here's a device that when you increase the voltage, that, and this is almost DC, is a long pulse of DC voltage being increased in this direction. It sags up, not down. What it actually does is it buckles to an anti-symmetric state, and so it's putting a lot of pressure on one spring tip, and it's at an angle now relative to the uh, field plate. And now you can resonate these also, and you can cause them to go into a buckle mode at that resonant frequency. So these are all the possibilities. I think we've covered most of them. So I sat down and whoever's watching, you're the first in the world. And I said, okay, what are all the things I've seen? And I realized I'd seen so many things that I'd forgotten some of them. I was up really late last night. And, and I put down a tremendously long list of all of the types of failures and threw in some jargon that we use to describe some of the failures. And then I said, no, that's too long a list. In any way, some of those things are too exotic. I'm not even sure I remember how we got to that point. Well, anyway, this is what I came up with. I'm gonna start off at the very bottom so you don't panic. The very bottom, the thing I've been tracking since I joined UT Dallas and, and I feel really, really good right now that because the thing I have found recently is not at all the way that I thought a DMD works in terms of this twist bend energy. I think that I'm okay though with what I found because of things I found in the literature, which are almost like opaque mathematics to me, but somebody promises me, no, they're really mechanical engineering. I don't know, but um, that I have finally nailed this thing. But this energy feeds into secondary mechanisms and then a whole bunch of higher order things like mirror curvature changes slightly and suddenly you've got a different device. Okay, things are still under control at the next level. One of the unfortunate things that we did a long time ago is for, for valid reasons was we went up another level and because we had to reduce the uh, ensure contrast with light scattering, but we decided to take the mirror and stop the mirror on spring tips rather than stopping an underlying structure under the mirror on underlying spring tips. That puts a lot of stress on the mirror. And when you start scaling, you find that, that indeed uh, the technology does not scale well. And so we took another turn and that only bought us another generation of scaling. So having this offset constraint plane, which just means the mirror is landing on the spring tips, the restraints, rather than an underlying structure, uh, has been a real, real problem. And, and so uh, that actually is a secondary mechanism. If we didn't have the, the buckle stress, the uh, twist pin, being built in every time we touch down, then it wouldn't be a problem. Also, all those connection points uh, have uh, shells around them of metal, very thin metal, which can cause softening or inversion in those regions. That's a secondary problem. And finally, uh, uh, very thin oxide layer on the, uh, on the flexures uh, can then 
uh, relieve that surface stress over time by absorbing water, changing hydration states. That locks in the memory, that causes failure. Totally reversible if you bake the devices out, but you can't do that if they're out in the field. And, and so that's been a continual issue. Now the next click, if I can find the clicker here, is going to be all of the other things that we can see. Uh, we have uh, pixels that will pop up and they will stay up permanently up in the air. Others will go to very high tilt angles. Some will over rotate. We saw the mouse bites. Uh, we have twinklers uh, that, that plagued us for a long time and flutter and all kinds of stuff. Spring tips collapsing, uh, block boundary failures between uh, uh, blocks of mirrors. There's a high field between blocks, the way that we have to address and on and on and on and on. I left a lot out of this list. If you start at the top, you never get to the bottom. If you're at Texas Instruments, you have a schedule. You'll try to fix things, you'll try experiments, and you don't you don't even really get down to this level until it's in your face so you don't know what to do, and then it becomes more and more obvious. And and so what we're trying to do. Center for Digital Mems is to take a deep dive down through this, and that's why I chose that word. And it's, I lived with this stuff for a long, long time and, and never really, really thought I could get to this point and understand what was happening. Now, it turns out, that, and this is just a drawing of what we've got, we have two options. Uh, we can land a, a plate underneath the mirror on stops here. There's the flexure. Or we can elevate the mirror, and the mirror would be up here as well, except that this is the, the, the cantilever device. But we can also stop the mirror. Okay. And, and so what, what happens here is so interesting. Let's see. I'll just run through this sequence. I, I just put this down this morning actually. <laughs> um, so when we touch down on these stops, this flexure has uh, energy in it already. It has a stored moment uh, and it has uh, some shear energy. And, and, and so it's pre-energized. That's the important thing. And it's just waiting to get rid of that energy. Okay. So the next thing we do is we add a little bit of extra force. And actually, you know, I just wrote the differential down here, but we add a lot more actually. But if you add just a little bit more and you went through this, you would see that, that this, this tries to rotate against a stop, which, which causes a counter rotation, okay? The reason you want to add a lot of voltage is because if you don't want this mirror to go flying off in the air because you have to address it every at five kilohertz rates, for example. And and so it's seeing pulses, but it's supposed to stay. And so you need to have it stuck down really, really good with a bias voltage. OK, so what happens then is that extra load then creates bending moments in low and in, in further loading. OK. And when that happens, you start sliding. And you think, well, big deal. Well, the problem is, and, and now I can show it, the thing I've left out for years is the fact that when it starts to slide, you develop tension. And actual, actual, actual tension on this curved member, which is pre-energized, and when you keep, when you do that, what it does is it tries to flatten out this energetic moment that's in there. And so by pulling on this axially through having the ability to slide and to have this, 
these counter moments and this load, and this you can show mathematically, is creates tension, but the tension is relieved by flattening the moment distribution out, and it puts a lot of energy right into the base of where the connection points are, here and here. They're primarily there. So the greatest moment appears there. And so that's, uh, if you start off with that idea that I have energy stored and I'm also rotated, I'm, I'm twisted at the same time, that couples then the bending and the twisting together so that you don't launch by simply untwisting independent of unbending, you do a combination on bend and twist and sometimes you don't free yourself from the surface. You spend so much of the energy that, from the pulse that you just stay there and you have a failure. This is very exciting for me. It's an element that I have left out consistently for years. I don't know of anybody else that uh, has ever considered that. Uh, if they have, I sure would wish they'd come for uh, Now I'm going to follow up on that. This is a secondary thing at every connection point. We have uh, these little membranes and stress because we have a stress relief in this direction and those can soften. They're affected by moisture. Uh, you can get elastoplastic transitions and so you can get pixels that over rotate magically and then come back and they can start operating again. And so these are the boundary shells and they have a whole bunch of sensitivities. So that was the next level up. And there you can see some of the failures. These spring tips have actually bent down permanently because of that. Now, you know, I always like to go back in history and, and compare. And when I was uh, really uh, love, I love history and um, uh, I've gone back to the 18th century, I claim that most things were invented in the 18th century. If you just go back far enough and I always point to the fact that of a French uh, a chemist without credentials, Miss Popples, uh, actually uh, helped me and inspired me to do something that saved our technology and that is uh, self-assembled monolayers which we'd use to this day in fact the one that i actually chose uh, uh way way back uh and 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 she without credentials discovered self-assembled monolayers and gave three papers before the royal society in england with lord Rayleigh's permission and that was never ever ever done okay so how would I know about that? Well, that's that's I just study history and I like to. So here's the the, the field effect transistor. Uh, it, this is what's in an integrated circuit. It has other names, uh, but when it was invented in, in 1970 and they tried to scale it down, which we're trying to do, you got a very high electric field at the end of the transistor channel, which eject injected electrons into the oxide you got a charge build up eventually you would get a threshold shift and the transistor would cut off and stop working gosh that sounds like a digital micro mirror device what was their early solution well they were going to optimize the process conditions for most stable oxide well that sounds exactly like what we've tried to do what was the real solution limit the charge injection by actually making a change to the way that you build it, okay, an architectural change, very famous architectural change uh, that, that, that saved the day. It came from uh, IBM. Same business, we have twist bend energy storage. We get a surface response because of that so energy storage, we get a slow response with time of hydration. We get a memory effect. We get latcher recapture. Device cut off, latcher recapture. What's our solution? Dehydrate the surface. Detect with a passivant. What's the real solution? Limit the charge injection. Limit the twist bend response. Hmm. How? been thinking a lot about that now that I know how DMDs work. I see four approaches that are feasible. Two require vertical integration. In other words, more layers of metal. And what's wrong with that? Because, uh, uh, you know, the integrated circuit world has done that forever. 
So this is what you get out of history. Or this is what I get out of history. I get exact parallels. Okay, it's really cool. Really, really cool. Okay. I'm I'm done. I don't know if I come in on time. Yes, I have. Almost. Amazing. I've never done that before. Now, since I've got all this time, I don't know. There may be two or three people out there watching this. Okay, that's fine. You are the first three people. Trust me. They've seen this. Am I going to get into trouble? I hope so. I, <laughs> I hope I get some attention. I have some ideas and um, and what I've shown you doesn't really help you anyway because you need five hundred million dollars just to get started. <laughs> so anyway, OK, well, that's it. And I uh, glad that you were here today. Th thanks for watching. Dr. Hornbeck, we do have one question in the queue at this time, and mm -hmm. that is what's the major difference between DMD and MOS? F-E-T. M-O-S, did you say? Yes, what's the difference between DMD and MOSFET, M-O-S-F-E-T? Oh yeah, the MOS, oh I'm sorry, I didn't explain that, did I? Uh, no, it's a, it's just a, uh, a transistor that's done in a planar fashion. Uh, it's an MOS transistor and uh, it has different designations, but every integrated circuit has these. Uh, and, and, and so you have an in doping source and drain. You have a, a, an oxide over that, over the gate region. You have a metal plate. Uh, and so that's, that's what I was referring to. So we're talking, we're comparing tra a transistor, uh, which could be in, in a digital circuit uh, with a DMD. And, and I'm simply pointing out the, the, the fact that when you try to patch something, eventually, if you're, if you're trying to scale the technology down, that patch won't work anymore. Okay. And so they tried to patch it, but when they went to scale it down to a half a micron, the patch didn't work. Somebody had to fix the problem. They had a theoretician that predicted the effect. A year later, somebody from IBM, same company, came in with a practical solution. So I'm not a theoretician, but I, but I can tell you that I understand the fundamentals now. I may have a solution or I may not, and, and that's really going to be up to the people that really, really know all the ins and outs of, of what we're involved with uh, today. But I love those analogies because they often point to courageous people who did the right thing in the end. And some of them because they had to, they were forced to an economic decision, but they always came through. And that's what I hope that we can do with this technology uh, in the future. Thank you, Dr. Hornbeck. A few other questions in the queue. Has DMDs or have DMDs been used to show problems in the hum human body? And if so, what could be shown? Uh, it, well, I, I know for one thing, um, recently I read a paper uh, in an ophthalmoscope uh, for uh, using a DMD to literally steer light by uh, in a lidar sort of fashion, like a radar sort of fashion, which is one of the applications, by the way, uh, for for uh, the DMD, it is to steer light and to made to measure distances, and and uh, and so that's one application. There there are many others, uh, and I, I tell you what, I'm sorry, I I ought to I ought to give a talk on that. It's so fascinating. I I didn't realize until a few months ago how much of it had gone into the medical area, but there's much, much more than that. And I was, it was so, it was the same, wonderful at the same time, it was perplexing because I couldn't quite understand what the heck are they doing, you know? Um, and it's been an explosion. I then went back to Google Scholar and I did the last 10 years and, and I, I had a revelation. I, I found out how popular I am for one day, <laughs> but no, I. I Googled digital micromirrors and not with device on it. 
And I got a whole ton of papers that had digital micromere device in the title. Now that tells you something. And, and then hundreds and hundreds that were about digital micromeres, and then some, of course, that were just referencing them. But another thing I found out, the, the, uh, the trademark name is DLP. That used to stand for digital life processing. Uh, that's what we called it, but you can't maintain a trademark, right? If you use, if the trademark is an abbreviation. So if you're Kleenex, you can't keep saying, allowing people to say, at least you can't advertise, say, hey, you know, you, you can't use it generically. And so we lost DMD because we use it generic, and I'm glad we did. I'm glad that it's not a trademark. But I, I, I then Googled digital light processing and I got as many hits as I did with digital micromirrors, okay? And, and that's because, because of the high speed nature of these ones and zeros, 5,000 different combinations, you can do all kinds of marvelous things, literally doing digital light processing. It's, it's quite amazing. And then I decided, okay, now I'm gonna Google and see how many times Larry Hornbeck is mentioned where referencing me as having written something doesn't count. You've got to actually say Larry Hornbeck in the invented. There's a bunch of them. I've forgotten the number, but I was I was really amused by that. It's very special to some people. It's totally unique in the world. And I hope that we can advance the technology at uh, UT Dallas, its proper home in Texas, in Dallas. <laughs> Be great. Thank you, Dr. Hornbeck. A few other questions in the queue for you. How do you create the chips with regards to positioning the various micro mirrors used in the chips? How do we position? How do you um, create the chips with regards to positioning the various micro mirrors used in the chips? Yes, okay. Well, we, we do just a, a planar process of, of multiple layers uh, where we deposit a layer uh, and and then we etch that layer, we deposit another layer. So the same way you would build an integrated circuit. And so what we do between the metal layers for the DMD, we pattern a metal layer, but then we put down a photoresist and, and we harden that with deep UV light and, and we form openings where we want connections, then we put down another metal layer and so on. When we're done, we have color resist between all the metal layers of, of the device. And so then we just merely use an oxygen plasma to strip out all that organic material. And then we do another step, uh, which is a passivant, as we seal these in a uh, hermetic uh, environment. Uh, the DMD will take UV light, uh, too deep UV, but it will. Liquid crystals won't really. And it will go out to the near IR, and liquid crystals aren't very effective out there. Uh, so, but you have to really, really carefully package these devices against uh, uh, moisture. And that's because of this fundamental underlying thing, this Swiss bend flexural energy that's stored and transforming by the stress that's developed one form of oxide and a hydration state to another form. Erasing that flexure memory, the stress memory that's stored, making the device seem like the metal's bent and it just stops functioning on you. So there, there you have it. We spend a lot of time on packaging. That's a big difference between us and, and liquid crystals technology. But it's a simple, Simple planar process, well, the same way you build uh, uh, transistors, integrated circuits. And Thank a, you, Dr. In a, a wafer fab, a standard wafer fab. Apologies for the interruption and thank you for the thorough explanation. Um, one final question in the queue for you today, and that is um, the control signal for switching involves step transitions and voltages. It would seem that driving the mirrors with waveforms that would accelerate and de 
accelerate the mirror from one position to another would reduce damage. Are there, are, are there alternative switching signals that enable robustness? Well, you know, um, the, the method that I chose uh, in 1980, uh, uh, let's see, early 1988 is not the one we use today and it's much more straightforward, but it's the wrong approach. Uh, <clears throat> to robustly launch these things, you literally have to catapult them, which means that you have to have a high voltage pulse to really push them down against the spring tip and launch them. At that point, uh, you don't have good control over them because they don't all have precisely the same trajectory. Uh, and, and, and so I also came up with a concept of soft landing, which also doesn't work because you to do that, you have to sacrifice some of the launch. So uh, I, I think we probably figured that one out. We've had a lot of iterations uh, and, and everything that we've done, you know, has been, we've learned the hard way. And somehow we've come out on top. And how can that be? One company, <laughs> a technology that's growing by leaps and bounds in areas I don't even understand. Okay, it's wonderful. Dr. Hornbeck, thank you very much for your time, talent, yeah. and resources that you shared with the attendees and the community at large. Have a nice afternoon.